So it is now the 1st of December. We have 9,148 cases. Hang on just a minute. I just lost a, I'm going to duplicate it. Hold on a minute, folks. Is it back? It's a split screen. Uh, that's what I was afraid of. Hang on, let me do this again. I think I had this down by now. Uh, share. Yes. Better? Yes? Yes, though I see the, the slides on the side still. It's not full screen. Right. There you, go. you got yeah. it. There we go. Okay. So we are at 9,148 cases. Um, just to put that in perspective, I think about 7,200 and some of those have been since the 1st of September. So... Uh, September, October, November, we have seen the vast majority of cases. Um, 119 deaths, um, all but 40 of those have occurred since the 1st of September as well. We have 3,989 active cases, 5,040 recovered case fatality rate of 1.3%. Currently, 171 confirmed or suspect cases in McLaren McClar and Sparrow Hospital. Um, 153 of those are confirmed, 138 are on COVID floors, 15 in the ICU, 14 ventilated, and we had 64 emergency department visits that were COVID related in the previous calendar day, which is always going to be one day before the day of the briefing. Um, so total hospitalizations since the beginning of, um, well, early April uh, looks like this. So we saw this sharp increase in hospitalization start in uh, mid-October, early to mid-October. Um, I guess the one thing I can say that is good news about that is they seem to have plateaued at somewhere around the 140, 150-ish range. We can look at from um, August 4th when they changed the reporting format, um, COVID patients on the hospital floor as well as in ICU. Um, the red line shows you the um, number of patients ventilated on any given day, and this more neon pink line is um, emergency department visits. So we did have a little bit of an increase over the last few days in emergency department visits reported on the 29th. So that leaves us right now at 43.6% uh, of our cases are still active, 55.1% have recovered, and 1.3% are deceased. Now, I will tell you that this is by definition of recovery, um, state of Michigan, which is 30 days past onset of COVID and still alive. So we do use that definition as that is the state definition. So I can tell you that there are people that are in the hospital for lengths of time that they are not recovered at 30 days after onset, but that is the standard that's being used across the state. And that is um, that, that number reflects um, that benchmark. So here's our cumulative case curve. We continue to climb as we have been climbing since um, basically early November when we had that sharp spike in cases, a little bit of flattening, and then we were off into an even sharper spike in cases. So our incidence curve um, over the course of the pandemic looks like this. Um, this was that outbreak we had in um, mid-June, early July. This was the MSU-related cases in September. And this is kind of where we are now. As you can see, we ha do have a little bit of bouncing around. Um, and that is fairly normal. Um, percent positivity is still hovering around 10%. Um, we did reach um, about 12% at one point in time, um, but have been over the 5% mark since, well, most of the time anyway, since late, late October. 
if we put those both into rolling averages, um, smooths out all that bouncing up and down for the most part. Um, this is basically where we are right now. And this trend does sit, tend to, to be continuing downwards. Remember, you know, when there's a little two or three day spike one direction or the other, as more numbers come in from previous days, since it is a seven day average, you know, something that's turning up can suddenly turn down. Likewise, something that's turning down can turn back up. So always in the most recent uh, you know, numbers here, realize that a seven day average is going to put the next seven days worth of numbers in with this and can change um, the trajectory of those things. Our percent positivity had been on the rise um, since uh, again, back in mid, mid, mid October, really I'd go back to early October, even though we had this dip, um, we did dip down a little bit below 10%. We're seeing this increase up again. Um, and hopefully that will turn the other direction and start coming back down. By zip code, we see um, 48823 still the most prominent in our zip codes, followed by 48911, and then on down from there. These marks here are um, basically, these are case ranges. So um, when we look in these zip codes, you'll see that there's going to look like a high rate in those cases, case ranges, um, because of low population. And that's when we get into cases like, actually, I think I just said that wrong. Um, I think those marks were for something else, so I apologize. But I explained last week that down in Onondaga, we have a population of about 2,000 down there. So it does not take very many cases to put them in uh, from a rate perspective per 100,000, quite a number of cases per 100,000. So with just 2,000 people down there, just a few cases will elevate that rate. So low population always creates a little bit of a rate artifact. But again, it's also important to know that with a population of 2,000, um, there's considerable cases down there for, for what's really a considerably small population. Um, East Lansing 48823 still are most prominently um, colored zip code, highest rate. So looking at our heat map, um, we still see, you know, this, this yellow spot around um, just north of campus in East Lansing. Um, and we do see some darker spots here in these as well. Basically, as we get more cases, the intensity of that shading will go down, balancing with the other cases coming up in other zip codes. But we still do see all of this going on in East Lansing, not really changing a lot. Um, this is the way this has looked for quite a while now. Uh, by sex, 50% of our cases are female, 50% male. And then by age group, we have still 15% in the 10 to 19 age group, which is slightly elevated over the 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and still seeing the highest percent of cases in the 20 to 29 age group, though that is dropping from, I think we reached a high of maybe 42% of our cases in that age group. Uh, by race, 60% of our cases Caucasian, 12% Black or African American, 4% Asian, 15% other, and 8% unknown. Um, that when we do that by rate, um, our Caucasian rate at 2,566 is not quite one and a half times lower than the rate for African American population. So you can see this disproportionate burden of illness in our African American population here in Ingham County. By ethnicity, 74.6% not Hispanic or Latino, 8.1% Hispanic or Latino, 17.3% unknown. This unknown category is probably going to start to grow as, as um, a number of you know, contact tracing changes have been made. And so we're not necessarily in contact with every person at this point in time. We had to do some prioritization. And so we're going to we're going to see without full investigations going on some fields that are left blank, and particularly sometimes we see ethnicity as something that we have to go back and fill in with. Um, our Hispanic or Latino rate is 3,195 compared to 2,531 for our non-Hispanic or Latino. So we again see that disproportionate burden of disease in our Latino population compared to our non-Latino population. When we look at deaths, we have 1.7% um, 
below the age of 40, 1.7%, 40 to 49, 5%, 50 to 59, 13.4% in the 60 to 69, and then by far um, our two largest um, age groups for deaths are the 70 to 79 age group at 34.5 and over 80 at 43.7. By sex, um, deaths 52.9% are male, 47.1% are female. By race, 72.3% are Caucasian, 20.2% are African American or Black, 1.7% Asian, 3.4% other, and 2.5% unknown. When we look at our deaths by ethnicity, 87.4% not Hispanic or Latino, 5.9% Hispanic or Latino, 6.7% unknown. Um, looking at deaths by zip code, um, not surprisingly, our two highest um, zip codes in terms of cases are our two highest zip codes in terms of deaths, um, with 48823 at 26 deaths and 48911 at 21 deaths. Um, and then you can see the distribution in other, um, this, this one might look a little surprising here, 49251 is Leslie um, with eight deaths. There was a, um, a, 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 an assisted living home for people in hospice down there that, that, that a number of deaths occurred down there. Um, when we look at deaths by rate, um, which we are able to do at this point in time for Caucasian and African American only, we don't have enough deaths to calculate an Asian rate or anything like that. But uh, looking at this rate, we have uh, 37 for Caucasian, 55.2 for African American. I think that's about a 1.2 or 1.3 fold difference in rates of death between our Caucasian and African American population. When we look at our deaths by month, um, we certainly are seeing our highest number of deaths here in the month of November, where we saw 45, um, 23 in the month of October, 10 in the two months prior to that. Um, summer was our, our calm time, except for um, a fairly significant outbreak, or at least it seemed significant at the time. It seems fairly small now. Um, and then deaths, of course, were relatively high um, in April and May, but certainly not what we're seeing now in October and November, and now we start um, with December. If we look at those deaths by week, um, you know, looking out here, you know, of course, this is this week, so I don't usually count that, but if you take this last four weeks and average them together, I think you're going to find we're looking at about 10 deaths a week um, right now in Ingham County. And then probably going to um, discontinue showing this. You can always find this on the MSU website. Um, we calculate these numbers for them every week. Um, and so we did see our highest number of MSU related cases back in early September. We did see a spike um, or a, you know, what I would call a significant increase in, in the um, weeks of November 2nd and November 9th after having come down from that highest week back in September, um, but those do seem to be coming down again now, and I believe that is the end. Thank you, Linda. Does anyone have any questions for Health Officer Vail? We don't have any questions in the queue, so if you have a question, please go ahead. Go ahead, Scott Bull. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Linda. Um, Linda, it was reported earlier today um, the letter that you sent to state Senate leaders. I wonder if you've gotten any response. Um, well, I first response is I, I didn't realize it had gotten to the media until I saw it this morning myself, so it was not a letter that was sent to the media. It was a letter sent to a couple of leaders at the Senate. I have had um, from the legislature, both on the House side as well as the Senate side, um, members as well as staffers um, that have expressed concerns about, um, you know, 
what can we do, you know, within the legislature around these rules, given that, you know, there's certainly been a politicization and some, some other things around that, um, you know, not necessarily at the legislature on board with a statewide mask mandate, those sorts of things. Um, the letter really pretty much framed it around, you know, the legislature is also an employer. Um, as an employer, the, um, you know, the MIOSHA rules for employers are in effect for them as well. And we certainly have, you know, a number of occasions where we're, you know, meeting um, large number of people's in room, people in rooms, um, staffers who are concerned, staffers who are concerned about what's going on in the office buildings outside of the Capitol um, and those sorts of things. And so um, I, I have fielded a number of those concerns and complaints. And I did actually write a letter to the House of Representatives back in April, which didn't get out to the media. That was when they had a staff person that had um, tested positive and they had had a recent session and many people were close to, the, to, to that person again, you know, in, in a time when mask wearing was not very common and that sort of thing. So I did alert the House of Representatives at the time that they would, would need to quarantine for, I think by the time we were aware of the case, you know, it was only another five days or so. So this is not the first time I've had the occasion to um, write such a letter, but um, you know, when you get enough phone calls from enough staffers, and again, some members who are expressing deep concerns about their safety and health and, and the ability for the legislature to implement at least some of the basic MIOSHA rules um, related to employee protections in the workplace, um, it seemed an appropriate thing to do. Any response though from leadership or um, is, the, is the state capital beyond the purview of your enforcement powers? The State capital, I believe, is beyond the purview of my enforcement powers. Um, just like the city of Lansing police um, don't have the ability to police the, you know, the capital grounds. The capital is the state and is under the state's jurisdiction. Um, but you know, the house office building, the you know, those buildings are buildings in Ingham County, um, and those are employers and employees working in Ingham County. And that's why really I emphasize more than anything the MIOSHA rules that are important and are in place for employers to follow with their employees to create safe workplaces for employees. Um, and of course, you know, best you can encouraging them, you know, even in session, which, you know, that's all it was. It wasn't a, you know, I think the, I think the free press article says that I cited them, which kind of feels like, you know, I issued them a ticket or a citation or something, which which isn't quite what happened. I don't, you know, cite, maybe it's like identified, maybe they, they had a different way of using that word, but probably an odd word to use in the context of um, enforcement and things like that are going on. There, there was no citation issued. Um, it was a letter just expressing the fact that there had been concerns expressed and um, that, that it was a critical time to hopefully be attentive to some of these um, mitigation steps that we can take to minimize the impact of illness on people, including their staffers, um, and certainly in those office buildings um, where we have a number of employees, you know, everything from cleaning staff to, you know, just, I mean, there's a lot of staff that work in those buildings. I'm sorry, but have, have the speaker or the Senate majority leader responded in any way? No, they have not. Okay, thank you. Emily Joan Elliott, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, my question was about the number of deaths in the 48823 zip code. I remember when the MSU cases took off, you had said that the students might not kill their grandparents, but they might kill somebody else's um, in terms of community spread getting out there. And I was wondering if being the cases seem to be so centered in young people, if you could speak to any information on the demographics of those who died in 4823 and how the community spread there might have occurred and when those deaths have occurred too were they following um that outbreak there or were they coming before as well so um if you look at the deaths by week and the deaths by month you'll see that those deaths you know primarily occurred um in the months of well September we had 10 but October and November and, and that holds true for the you know the largest share of the deaths in the 48823 region as well. 
Um, you know, we came down off of that really huge spike in cases in September, really to kind of start picking up the wave, you know, the beginning of the wave of um, the, the most recent surge in cases, which, you know, while also impacting the MSU community to some extent is really community wide. And so you can't really point to, you know, anything directly there. You know, you know, it's, there's no way to directly connect them. You know, the, the science of COVID says that huge surges in cases um, lead to the delayed indicators of increased hospitalizations and, in, and increased deaths. Um, I did have a chart at one point in time that showed you hospitalizations um, at, I believe it was Sparrow Health System, with arrows marking the June outbreak, um, which was, you know, a bar and restaurant outbreak, as well as a couple of other outbreaks that happened. And then, you know, a few weeks after that, a short time after that, an increase in hospitalizations. Likewise, there was the significant transmission that we saw in September in the MSU-related community. And within a short period of time after that, there was a significant spike in hospitalizations that began. Um, you know, that, that's the science of how it works. Do I have anything that directly ties those things together? I don't. Um, most of us don't. Um, we just know that if we don't keep COVID in control in our communities, if we have huge surges in cases, outbreaks that run out of control, those sorts of things, that ultimately what we will see is hospitalizations and deaths. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We don't have any questions in the queue. So if you have a question, please go ahead. I have a question. Go ahead, Rachel. So how are the cases in Ingham County since the lockdown? Have you seen a decrease or increase or are, are they still on the rise? Um, cases are decreasing. Um, they started decreasing really almost close to or around the time that the order went into place. So they seem to have been on their on their way down anyway. As I said, when you do those seven day rolling averages, it's it's easy for them to start to look like they're coming down and then all of a sudden spike back up. They truly are coming down now. We are um, what two weeks into the the latest order now. So within that two to three week range, you should see some effect. So it's not entirely impossible that that, that order did have some impact on this downward trend um, that we're seeing right now, because we are seeing a downward trend and we are seeing that, that downward trend statewide. The only thing I would caution you is that we started seeing that downward trend before it would have um, been due to that order alone. So we might be seeing a combination effect of you know, cases might have been starting to go down a little bit, and maybe we have a sharper trend downwards because of more, you know, more actions that were taken. Um, so, uh, you know, I think time is going to tell. Um, I think we're all concerned about travel and gatherings and those sorts of things that happened at Thanksgiving, and that may muddy the waters for us in the sense that, you know, as we're starting to expect to see cases go down because of the recent order. Um, that went into effect um, maybe two weeks ago yesterday, I believe, that we're also potentially going to see spikes in cases as a result of travel and gatherings related to the holidays. And so, you know, how to measure the relative um, impactfulness of that order at the same time that we know that travel, did, I mean, airports were crowded. I mean, we saw the stories about how many people traveled, um, and we know people traveled and we know people gathered. Um, many, many people stayed home. Many, many people had either gatherings just amongst their own, their household, or I mean, I've talked to lots of people who absolutely were very, very cautious as well. So I by no means am saying everybody just ignored it and went out. But um, I, think, I think because of the holidays coming right at this time, it's, it's going to be a little challenging to tell, but we will see in another week whether those numbers continue to go down. Okay. And then follow up to um, that question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the rapid tests and the PCR tests? I know that Ouch Urgent Care from Clinton County opened up a little, um, what is it, rapid testing. So kind of talked about the differences, what you think, because they were telling me that um, rapid tests are going to help minimize or help stop the spread of the virus if more people do rapid tests over PCR. 
Well, that's not completely true. And there is a lot of information coming out, you know, promoting the rapid antigen tests. And they're not, a, they're not all bad. I, I will say that they are not as sensitive. Um, but or or as specific, so you get a false positivity and a false negativity. The, the the best usage of the rapid test is for somebody who essentially meets what we call the case definition for COVID. So if they are presenting with symptoms that really align with COVID, and certainly if they've had a recent exposure or something like that, and you take one of these rapid antigen tests, um, we refer to it as pretest probability. So if you go into the test, you know, kind of looking like this is a case of COVID, and then the rapid antigen test says this is a case of COVID, you're pretty much confident that it's a case of COVID. Um, if you go into a rapid test with no, it's just, it's probably not the best thing to do for, for asymptomatic people, that sort of thing, because just because of the numbers. The other thing that I would say is that if somebody is symptomatic, um, if a physician is highly suspicious of or thinks they meet the case definition for COVID, and then this person is negative on one of these rapid antigen tests, we would then recommend that that person get the PCR test because that pre-test pop, pro, excuse me, pre-test probability is not lining up with what we're seeing in terms of the result. And we do see that happen sometimes, and that's why you know we we turn to the PCR test for that confirmatory. Um, the other test is not a confirmatory test. However, they're rapid. We're getting them deployed quickly. Um, they're very effective for screening, especially if you're doing um, like frequent screening. That's what's going on with the Big Ten. They're doing um, an antigen test, but they're testing their teams um, you know, at least six days a week. So when you're testing with a test that might have a little less sensitivity and specificity to it, but you're doing it so routinely, then that can be quite helpful in keeping the environment um, from, from getting to like outbreak range. You know, it's very easy to, to continue to test and, um, and pick those cases up. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions? Last call for questions for Health Officer Linda Vale. I have one more. Go ahead. One last one. Um, any reports of restaurants not following the orders? How is that going? Um, there were some originally in the beginning. I haven't seen, I haven't heard any lately. We did have to go out um, after the order the weekend after the order originally went into place and um, get some restaurants closed down that decided that they were going to be open anyway. So I did not hear anything this last weekend, nor have I heard anything recently. So that doesn't mean that something hasn't happened that I don't know about, because there's a lot going on. And I have environmental health people that work with restaurants, and I have other people that complaints flow into. So you know, if, just because it didn't come to me doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I haven't heard anything. Okay. 